If it's Tuesday, we're following breaking news out of Baltimore, where emergency rescue teams are racing to find at least six people still unaccounted for after a cargo ship crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, sending the entire bridge plummeting to the water. Plus, the Supreme Court hears arguments in a consequential abortion-related case for the first time since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, in a case that could restrict access to the country's most widely used abortion pill. And teaming up on the trail, President Biden and Vice President Harris campaigning together in Battleground, North Carolina, as the White House looks to flip the Tar Heel State. And RFK Jr. picks his running mate, naming an attorney with no background in politics to be his vice president. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Garrett Hake in Washington. We begin today with the breaking news out of Baltimore. This video captures the moment a cargo ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge around 1.30 this morning, causing nearly all of the mile-long span to collapse into the Patasca River below. This is all the remains of the Key Bridge right now. Rescue teams are searching for six people believed to be missing. Moments ago, Maryland Governor Wes Moore, along with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, gave an update on the rescue operations that began shortly after the collapse. This is very much still a search and rescue mission. We are still actively looking for survivors. We know, and that's the pledge we've made to these families, and this is still very much an active search and rescue mission. And there is not a single resource that we will hold off on deploying. I have already authorized the deployment of everything from air, land, and sea resources to make sure that this search and rescue operation is carried out to its fullest intent. Our work is just beginning to rebuild this bridge and deal with impacts in the meantime, to reopen this port and deal with supply chain impacts in the meantime. But today we are most acutely focused on the emergency operations underway uh, and on the families that have been impacted. I have no doubt that we will rebuild together and that Baltimore will come back stronger than ever before. As the investigation into what caused this ramps up, let's take a closer look at what was happening as the ship approached the Key Bridge. In the span of about four minutes, the ship appears to lose power twice. As you can see, the lights do come back on for a few moments, but then the ship goes dark again. The power appears to be restored a second time, but by then the ship was already bearing down on one of the bridge's main supports. Investigators say the crew was able to notify authorities about its power issues, allowing them to stop traffic on the bridge. Authorities are also dealing with the widespread ramifications of this bridge collapse. The Port of Baltimore handles more than 11 million tons of cargo a year, and right now all traffic in and out is suspended. Traffic is also being rerouted along Interstate 695. More than 30,000 vehicles cross that bridge on a typical day. President Biden says senior members of his administration briefed him on the situation this morning. He addressed the situation from the White House today, saying his prayers are with everyone involved and that he plans on visiting Baltimore in the coming days. We're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. We're going to work hand in hand with the support of Maryland to support Maryland and whatever they ask for. It's my intention that the federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. And I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. Joining me now is NBC News correspondent Ryan Nobles at the scene in Baltimore. Also with me is structural engineering expert John Pistorino. And in a moment, I'll be joined by Nick Mosby, Baltimore City Council President. Looks like we've got Nick there now. So, uh, Ryan, I'll start with you. What's the latest on the search and rescue operations as we know it? You were just in that uh, news conference there. What more do we learn from the governor and the secretary of transportation? To be honest with you, Garrett, not a whole lot. Uh, there hasn't really been much of an update on the status of the search and rescue 
since very early this morning when we first learned the number of people that search and rescue crews were in search of. Uh, and it was, I think, around 5 o'clock this morning that we initially learned uh, that two people had been rescued and that they were still searching for six others. Uh, since that time, there's been no real substantive update uh, other than to say that that search process continues. But you do get the sense that there's uh, some reality setting in here. We're approaching 15 hours since this accident initially happened. Uh, the water temperature is frigid. Uh, it has still been a very cold day here uh, in Baltimore. And the idea that someone could survive under conditions like that is becoming less and less likely. Still, uh, the law enforcement officials here, you heard the governor just a few minutes ago, uh, they refuse to give up. Uh, and to a certain extent, the fact that they are committed uh, to recovering the survivors or rescuing people that need to be rescued, uh, it has, uh, to a certain extent, put a halt to the investigative aspect of all of this. The NTSB saying that they really can't get into the meat of their investigation until the search and rescue effort has come to an end. Uh, and it seems as though they're just not ready uh, for that uh, step to be taken, Garrett. Yeah, we've just been showing some live pictures of aerials of what the scene looks like now and some tape pictures of the more active scene earlier this morning, certainly suggesting that this effort has tapered off uh, to some degree this afternoon, Ryan. Um, you've been there since very early this morning. What's your take on how people in the area are reacting to what uh, they saw and heard there today? I mean, there is just an unbelievable uh, level of shock that this community is dealing with. Uh, if, if you've ever spent any time in Baltimore, and certainly if you lived here, you understand what an important piece of infrastructure the Francis Scott Key Bridge is. Uh, 35,000 vehicles cross over this bridge on a day-to-day -day basis. It is a major traffic artery. Uh, it's a traffic artery that is vital uh, to major shipping uh, endeavors, not just because of the harbor that it uh, crosses over, but also because there are many large semi-trucks uh, that can't go through the various tunnel systems uh, to get around the waterways in Baltimore. And so the Key Bridge is an essential uh, place for them to traverse. Uh, so there is uh, just kind of a, a physical reality that's setting in about how difficult that's going to make life around here. Uh, but there's also an emotional connection to this bridge. It's almost, it was uh, almost 50 years old. Uh, it was uh, part of the landscape, the skyline, if you will, of Baltimore. Uh, and so uh, there's just a, a wide range of emotions that uh, people in Baltimore and Maryland are dealing with right now, uh, the first and probably still uh, at the foremost is a sense of shock. Uh, Ryan, I heard your question to Secretary Buttigieg. Since we're both congressional reporters in our day jobs here, draw the linkage here between this 50-year-old bridge and the investments in infrastructure the Biden administration has been making as is trying to make uh, around the country. Yeah, Gary, you know, I, I think that uh, this is a very unique situation, as the secretary told me, uh, that we shouldn't uh, necessarily compare this to the to, to what seems to be a trend as it relates to bridge accidents around this country. Uh, but I don't think uh, there are too many people that watch that video and were just shocked by how quickly the bridge came down. Yes, it was a 1,000 foot uh, a shipping container, uh, an enormous amount of force that went into the bottom of that bridge. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is records uh, that have been uh, reviewed as it relates to the uh, need and the necessity for this for that bridge to have been up updated that do raise questions. And, you know, part of what President Biden committed to in his infrastructure plan was to specifically address the aging bridges all across the country. And I'm sure there are many Americans uh, that watch that video in horror thinking about a, a bridge that they cross over every single day. Uh, and that made them concerned. Now, the secretary said we shouldn't compare what happened here to any other bridge in the country. I think that is a, a truly an honest assessment. But uh, as this extends out to the overall conversation about how this is going to be fixed, uh, Congress is going to play a big role in whether or not they're going to go along with President Biden's idea to fully fund the restoration of the key bridge or whatever comes behind it. Yeah, we'll be following that story for a while. Uh, Ryan Nobles, thank you for your reporting. I'll let you uh, get back to it up there in Baltimore. And I'll turn now to John Pistorino, our engineering expert. And I think you can pick up right there, John, with what Ryan was saying. I and mean, tell me a little about your reaction when you saw this video of the bridge collapse. And were you as surprised as I, a layman, to see how fast and how completely the entire uh, span came down? Yes, well, I just want to say I congratulate the early responders for closing the bridge when they when they got the uh, mayday mm -hmm. signal from the ship itself that was a very good move but as far as this bridge uh, collapse is concerned uh you have right at the uh, the bridge you have a 
uh, truss bridge is called a through truss bridge with an arch and that arch uh, supports the deck of the bridge itself for the vehicular deck and so all the force of that arch goes right in into the abutments into the pier which supports the major part the critical part of the bridge which is where that ship hit now the problem uh, that i see is and then it relates to other bridges is that normally on bridges we have protection of those uh abutments and piers called dolphins and those are those are individually constructed piling which is supposed to intercept any kind of a, a vessel that might come in contact with the uh, integral parts of the bridge and deflect it away. And it's just the size of the dolphins that's involved here. I know this bridge had some dolphins in it, which are pilings which surround the, um, the, the pier itself. But I think um, anytime you have a uh, large shipping like this and you have an integral uh, movement uh, and bridges that are so critical that any time any kind of a uh, uh, accident like this could happen and that's why i think one of the things we will have to do and including the reconstruction of this bridge is to make sure that the dolphin protection system around the columns is adequate you know we had the collapse of the bridge in tampa florida mm. st petersburg the sky bridge and uh, this a, a very similar type of bridge actually it was a truss bridge hit hit by a, 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 a ship. And so when the new bridge, which was put up as a cable stay bridge, very high, very large. But one of the things that happened on that is that the designers and the contractors paid very special attention to the dolphin system that was going around the the um, the columns that support that bridge. John, I... many, many I was like a C student in physics in, in high school, but it's hard for me to imagine what could stop a boat of that size. But I want to ask you about what happens now. We've been showing those aerial pictures of the boat still blocking the ship, still blocking the harbor, sections of bridge laying on top of it. From an engineering perspective, how do we even start clearing that area, approaching some way to you know, turn that harbor back to being operational? Well, I mean, that kind of pickup debris is done by... Uh, cranes on barges, and they can be brought in very quickly, uh, and the, the the steel can be cut up and offlifted. I, I think that the demolition part of it will almost be a, a routine uh, experience. But back on the dolphins, I don't think I'm not saying that they they will stop the ship, but it will deflect the ship. That I is, see. the ship will change the course of the ship so it won't hit the most integral part of the bridge. Got it. All right. Um, John Pissarino, our engineering expert, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. I want to turn to Council President Mosby now uh, up there in Baltimore. Uh, what was your reaction to hearing the news of this this morning? How did you find out? How did word spread uh, in Baltimore? I mean, I was just uh, at awe. The, the rea I got a call about 2.30 a.m. and I heard that the key bridge, and I mean, and again, you kind of talked about it, but this is in central part right. of the livelihood of the entertainment of the connectivity of communities here in the city of Baltimore. Uh, and when I heard that it's collapsed, you know, I thought maybe uh, some concrete slabs had fallen in or maybe there was some structural issues. Uh, but to see the video, I, I just I couldn't believe it. It was like watching an action movie or something. Yeah, I had, I had a similar reaction watching it on my phone first thing in the morning. Like, no way this is an actual thing that just happened just up the road in Baltimore. Um, I know it's early, but how do you assess the federal government's uh, response thus far and the pledge from President Biden, for that matter, that the feds will be the one to pick up the cost of this? I mean, I think that the, you know, this entire time, I mean, local, state and federal um, have had a unified front uh, and literally been boots on the ground 24 hours uh, are really engaged in this rescue aspect uh, and have the president to come in, you know, while we're still focusing on the rescue and recovery effort to have the president come in uh, and provide some level of relief and comfort, uh, saying that our federal government will be there for the working class folks that depend on this bridge uh, to put food on the table, for the folks that depend on this bridge for upward bridge for upward mobility uh, and connectivity again uh, to the city. You know, I, you know, I, I think just that level of relief 
while we're still critically focused on the rescue and recovery side of things, um, uh, uh, couldn't have been at a better time. And, you know, I hope uh, that Congress truly understands uh, that this doesn't become a political, ideological, uh, a divisive uh, kind of football in Congress. And, and folks understand and know that this is speaking to the working class people uh, of this country. Uh, whether they're Republicans, whether they're Democrats, uh, but this is about working class folks uh, and about a, a really essential and important infrastructure uh, that provides them uh, to be the great Americans that they all are. What kind of economic impact do you anticipate seeing here? Because obviously this could take months, even if Congress acts, as you say, and doesn't use this as a political football, which I got to tell you, I'm less confident in. <laughs> Um, uh, it's a tremendous economic impact, and I mean that kind of goes back to the previous question. I mean, I mean Baltimore Port is one of the busiest ports uh, in the country. Um, when we talk about imports of cars, when we talk about imports to the Midwest as it relates to farming equipment, uh, it is the number one uh, and the busiest port in the entire country. Um, it, when we talk about its position and being further westward in than any other eastern seaboard port, um, mm. you know, it, it, when we talk about the connectivity to the railroad, knowing that the Baltimore, Ohio B&O was founded here and our connectivity through a CSX uh, inside of the, the Midwest, you know, it's a critical component uh, to the logistics and operations of moving uh, 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 things around our country. Uh, and, and again, that's where, you know, I hope that when we take a step back, uh, that it's not about the politics. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, we're at a point in time in our country uh, when this is a symbolic representation of understanding and knowing that from an infrastructure perspective, it helps all of us, no matter where our party lies, no matter where we lied in this country, that critical infrastructure like this is important for us to rebuild and be there. Uh, and I'm thankful for the president, uh, his very strong words, uh, as well as Secretary Buttigieg uh, and his strong words about the support for Baltimoreans, but more importantly, the support of America. Um, I have to think this becomes the big issue in city government now for as long as it takes. What happens now at a city level to minimize that economic impact and to try to get that corner of Baltimore, at the very least, back on its feet? Well, obviously, we've been working with our state partners. Our governor uh, and the uh, state partners have been uh, absolutely amazing um, as it relates to development plans for rerouting, um, as it relates to uh, ensuring that uh, the companies that are around there, that they are being communicated with uh, to kind of also pass that word on to, uh, you know, their employees. You know, I think that this is going to be an all hands on deck type of approach. You know, obviously, again, we've been so focused on the rescue recovery effort. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why, you know, folks are coming to the press conference and kind of getting the same information. But really, as it relates to the game planning, as it relates to the command center, it's really about rescue and recovery, ensuring that we have the right apparatus. We're being as creative, as innovative as possible. Uh, to do the rescue uh, and, and, and recovery effort uh, with dignity and protecting the sanctity of body. And I think that that has been the focus. It will continue to be the focus uh, as we go into tonight. Um, but um, the, the state has been uh, willing and prepared uh, to support the city. Uh, and, you know, Baltimore is a resilient place. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a working class community uh, that this bridge sits on. Um, well, folks understand and know and have passion, uh, uh, have a resilience, uh, and we'll, we'll rebuild from this. Um, but we have to do it in decency and order, uh, particularly as it relates to the six uh, 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 folks that uh, we still have not recovered yet to date. All right, Nick Mosley, uh, Baltimore City Council President, thanks for making time for us on what I'm sure is a very busy day for you. Thank you so much, Gary. And obviously, we'll keep following this story, bring you any updates as we get them across this hour. But up next, we're live at the Supreme Court, where the Biden administration is fighting to protect access to a widely used abortion medication in the most significant reproductive rights case since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Plus, President Biden and Vice President Harris joining forces for an appearance in North Carolina, a state that former President Trump narrowly won in 2020. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back and turning now to the top political story of the day, a story that on any other day would have been the top story, the Supreme Court hearing oral arguments yet again on the issue of abortion and reproductive rights. Today, it was a case that could determine access to the most commonly used abortion pill, mifeprestone. At issue, the FDA's decision to make mifeprestone easier to obtain. The Biden administration and the drug makers say that access to the drug, which has been available for managing abortion and mis abortions and miscarriages in the U.S. for 24 years, should not be restricted. But the plaintiffs who sued to ban the medication say that the FDA failed to evaluate the drug's safety risks. 
Much of today's arguments weren't actually about the FDA's decision, but rather whether the group of anti-abortion doctors who brought this lawsuit even had the legal standing to be in the courtroom. Just to confirm uh, on the standing issue, under federal law, no doctors can be um, forced against their consciences to perform or assist in an abortion, correct? Yes, we think that federal conscience protections provide broad coverage here. If you look at how uh, our organizations have been harmed, uh, they've been forced to divert resources from uh, speaking uh, and advocating for their pro-life mission generally um, to explaining uh, the dangers of the harm from abortion drugs. Well, aside from but death. that would be anyone who is uh, uh, aggressive or uh, vigilant about bringing lawsuits. Uh, just simply by using resources to advocate their position in court, uh, you say now causes an injury. That seems easily easy to manufacture. A skeptical Justice Thomas there. The case comes as medication abortion accounted for nearly two-thirds of all abortions in the United States last year. It's currently legal in 36 states. Joining me now outside the Supreme Court is NBC's Michel Sindor. Also with me is Michelle Goodwin, a professor of constitutional law and global health policy at Georgetown University, and Dr. Bhavik Kumar, a Texas-based abortion provider. Uh, Yamish, I'll start with you. We heard a little bit there, but take us further inside the court today. Beyond standing, what else did we hear from the justices? Well, we heard the justices really express skepticism in what is, of course, the most consequential abortion case to come before the Supreme Court since these justices overturned Roe v. Wade. And I want to look down a little bit because you really had a list of conservative justices who were asking questions that this seemed like they were leaning in favor of the FDA. You had someone like Judge Gorsuch saying this seems like a prime example of turning a what could be a small lawsuit into a nationwide legislative assembly. You had Justice Alito asking, well, whenever has a court second guessed the FDA? You also had someone like Amy Coney Barrett, who's also seen as a very conservative justice, asking whether or not the, the medical procedures in, in administering this abortion pill, would that change? And the answer was no, that women would not get ultrasounds um, if, the, if the FDA lost this case. So over and over again, you heard justices really questioning very deeply whether or not there was real harm here that would come from women. And of course, you heard um, both sides making robust arguments, and in particular, you heard the FDA and the Solicitor General really saying that this would bring great harm to women if the FDA were to lose this case, Garrett. And, Yamish, we also heard from the lawyer representing the drug's manufacturer. Just how closely is the pharmaceutical industry watching or participating in this case, particularly when it comes to the FDA's authority? Farmers' clinical companies are really closely watching this case. There was even a friend of the court brief filed with the Supreme Court that would say that if the, that if the FDA lost this case, that it would create, quote, chaos and that it would really upend the approval process and that it would really make it very hard for drug makers to go forward because of the different issues that would come up with approvals. Take a listen to a little bit more of that lawyer and what she had to say on the behalf of the maker of Mifepristone. Congress entrusted the FDA with the sole authority to approve new drugs and subsequent changes. The federal judiciary has respected that authority for decades, second-guessing the scientific, data-driven judgments of an independent agency is an extreme position that could inject uncertainty across American life. And over and over again, you heard echoes of that argument. While you had the lawyer for anti-abortion groups arguing that women have been harmed because this bill has become more accessible, you also had um, both lawyers for both the lawyers for Mipper Fristone as well as the U.S. Solicitor General, who was representing the FDA, both of them saying that really this is all based in science, that the FDA should have the authority to make science-based, evidence-based decisions, they said. All right, you, Michelle Sindor, thank you. I'll turn now to Michelle Goodwin. So what was your reaction as you listened to these arguments here today? How did you read what happened in the court? Well, there appeared to be skepticism amongst the justices, mm -hmm. and not just the liberal justices, but those justices that are conservative, the ones who were key in the overturn of Roe and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. They expressed skepticism as to whether these plaintiffs actually should have standing at all, whether if giving them the type of relief that they want is something that's disproportionate to the kinds of harms that they claim to have experienced, and whether they have actually experienced the kinds 
kinds of harms that they claim to have experienced. Do you think the focus on standing means we won't get a definitive answer from the court about how they view the bigger question about what the FDA can or should do on this or any other drug? Well, you know, I can answer that in two parts. And one, that this could be a procedural punt. And this would be a very logical procedural punt because, as you mentioned, they frame themselves as doctors. But amongst these plaintiffs uh, is an individual who has a master's degree in theology. He's not going to be in an ER unit uh, helping someone manage a <laughs> miscarriage. Hope we hope not. Uh, there is someone who's a dentist, you know, may help someone with an abscess or removing a tooth, but not necessarily emptying the uterus. And so the claim that these are people who actually have some real skin in the game mm -hmm. as plaintiffs is something that the court made shred of. But the second thing is that in the Dobbs decision, the court said that these would be matters that would be left to states. If mifepristone is removed from the marketplace, it affects not only Texas, where plaintiffs brought this case mm -hmm. before a district court judge, the lone sitting district court judge in Amarillo, but it would also affect states like California, New York, Colorado, uh, states that have now moved forward aggressively in protecting abortion rights legislatively, if not constitutionally, in their states. That Amarillo judge also a focus of recent change in judicial rules to prevent exactly yes. this kind of Thing from happening with judge shopping for specific cases. The other piece of this was something called the Comstock Act, which yes. a lot of people heard about today, perhaps for the first time. Explain the relevance. Well, the Comstock Act is one that was passed over a century ago, and it banned the shipment of abortifacients and contraception through the mail or through carriers. But it's an act that, while never having been reversed or repealed, is one that's not been utilized. For years, individuals have been able to get contraception through the mail. Mm -hmm. They've been able to get uh, mifepristone through the mail, uh, not just recently, but COVID really helped with that. It, it provided the means that for... That makes sense, yeah. Exactly. But Comstock is a strategy that's being used by anti-abortion groups to, in fact, not only make inroads against making sure that abortion would not be available, not only in places like Texas and other places where it's already been nearly banned, but also in other states where it has been available. But the other strategy is also to impact contraception as well. So what we heard in the court today was perhaps an opening salve uh, mm. with Comstock to do more of what anti-abortion groups are looking to do, not only with an anti-abortion approach, but also anti-contraception too. Do you think that plays into what we touched on with Yamish, the interesting alliance here between the Biden administration, reproductive rights activists, and the pharmaceutical industry who clearly have skin in the game and not having all of their other products regulated, whether how they be sold or sold through the mail? That is an excellent question. And I think this case is an important one for the court for a couple of reasons. You see this split. On one hand, a court that has leaned into an anti-abortion uh, kind of framework. We see that with Dobbs. But at the same time, this is a court that also may have some interest in making sure that the corporate structure, the pharma, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals as we know them, as mm -hmm. they are produced, as they are shared, uh, as they are sold throughout the United States, isn't disrupted. At a substantive level, what this means is that if there is a group of people that can somehow convince a judge that they should have standing in order to remove a vaccine from the marketplace, a drug from the marketplace. I mean, let's be clear, there are people that are COVID deniers sure. who believe that COVID vaccines harm people. There are people who believe that children shouldn't be exposed to polio vaccines or smallpox vaccines. What this case opens up is the possibility that any group of people who have those beliefs could still try to forum shop and possibly get those drugs removed from the marketplace, which would affect us all. Why the standing element here is very important. I want to turn now to Dr. Kumar. And, and Doctor, the potential access issues at play in this case all revolve around these post-2016 regulatory changes. Of those, uh, approval expansion to 10 weeks, reduction of in-person visits, availability by mail. Uh, as someone who uh, lives and works in a state where you do have significant access issues, what do you see as the most significant when it comes to this drug? Yeah, it's been about two years since the overturning of Roe. So we've seen hundreds of people that continue to need access to care. Um, and it's not just Texas. There are 13 other states in addition to Texas that have banned access to abortion. 
So that's meant that a lot of people have had to travel to access this care, have had to self-manage their abortion, or unfortunately, some people have had to remain pregnant. And when it comes to a case like this, that can ban one of the most common medications that's used in early abortion care. It means that these barriers will become even worse, meaning more people will have to travel, they'll have to stay even pregnant even longer than they would like to, and even more people will be forced to remain pregnant against their will. Of the states where medication abortion is legal, some have required a physician to prescribe these pills. Others require, say, any clinician can do it. What's the difference in terms of access and why does that matter? It matters because more choices, more access means that people have better outcomes. They can access the care they need quicker, more conveniently. There's less barriers to care. We know that medication abortion, including the use of mifepristone, is extremely safe. It's extremely effective. We found that with time that unlike the original label that the FDA provided saying that a physician had to do it, nurse practitioners and physician assistants are just as able to dispense a medication as we are. It's very common when I'm providing this medication that I say to patients that you probably won't feel anything different. This medication is really safe. You can do whatever you need to. There's really no need for the person to be there in person. They can receive it in the mail or however it may be convenient for them. Um, and the more options we have, the more we learn with time, the more we can meet people's needs. I'm very interested in the ways in which the private sector has become involved in this. And earlier this month, we saw CVS and Walgreens announce that they would begin selling mifeprestone. Does that increase access in a meaningful way? What does that mean for uh, doctors and abortion providers like yourself? Yeah, it's still really early. I think it's just been a week or two since some of these uh, large retail pharmacies have begun to receive and uh, dispense uh, the medication mifepristone, and it's only available in a handful of states. But again, every time we uh, provide more options for people, uh, we know that there's major retail pharmacies all throughout the country that are very convenient for folks, um, unlike some clinics that may be further away or more difficult to access. So the more options we have with a very safe medication like mifepristone, the better it is and the further we're going to get or the closer we're going to get to meeting people's needs um, and making sure we have multiple options for them to choose from. Uh, since the Dobbs decision, there's been a pretty significant rise in medication abortion. Is it a safe assumption that that number will continue to grow in your experience? I think so. I think when it's available and people can access it, we're seeing that it's a very popular option. More and more people have uh, soft medication abortion as their preferred option. We've also seen that when we're able to provide it at higher gestations, that it is more of an option for other people. And so um, we've also learned, as uh, Dr. Goodwin was saying from the COVID-19 pandemic, that it is safe to provide via telemedicine. About 16% of medication abortion is provided via telemedicine. So again, I think the more options we have and the more convenient it is for people, I wouldn't be surprised that more and more people are accessing this care as their preferred option. All right, Michelle Goodwin and Dr. Kumar, we have to leave it there. Thank you both for your expertise. And in developments of a totally different variety, today the judge in Donald Trump's upcoming criminal hush money trial hit the former president with a partial gag order. The ruling bars Mr. Trump from making public statements about known or potential witnesses, as well as any juror or prospective juror in the case. He's also barred from discussing lawyers in the case, court staff, and Manhattan District Attorney's Office staff members if those statements are made with the, quote, intent to materially interfere with the case. The order does not apply to the judge or Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg. The judge referenced Trump's past attacks, saying anything similar would, quote, undoubtedly risk impeding the orderly administration of the court. That case is set to go to trial April 15th. Up next... Independent presidential hopeful RFK Jr. rolls out his running mate. Who is she and why is the long shot candidate making this move now? We're on the trail in Oakland next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. President Biden and Vice President Harris just wrapped up a rare joint appearance in North Carolina. The event was focused on expanding health care access. In his remarks, the president painted a stark contrast between his health care agenda and that of Republicans, accusing Republicans in Congress of once again trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And while this visit to Battleground, North Carolina, is technically a White House event and not a campaign stop, there are definitely 2024 undertones. North Carolina, of course, a state that former President Trump narrowly won in 2020. And the latest polling out of the state show Mr. Trump with a slight edge over President Biden in a head-to-head -head matchup, though we should note it's clearly within the margin of error. 
Joining me now is Mike Memoli, who's covering the president and vice president on that visit to North Carolina. So, Mike, it's been a while since we've seen these two together in a battleground state. What does that tell us about just how important this visit is on policy and clearly politically as well? Yeah, absolutely. You don't often see, and I was thinking a lot back to 2012, I couldn't even come up with too many examples of when President Obama and then Vice President Biden campaigned with one another. But this really signals how important North Carolina is to the Biden campaign's electoral pathway to 270 electoral votes. They're just finishing today about an 18-day post-State of the Union swing of what the Biden campaign has explicitly said are what they view as the battleground states. And in seven of those eight states, they are playing defense, especially when you talk about a place like Michigan, where the war in Gaza is particularly making Biden vulnerable with some mm -hmm. key demographic groups. And so North Carolina is the chance that the Biden team sees to go on offense. North Carolina, 16 electoral votes. Michigan, 15 electoral votes. So swapping one for the other there and holding the rest, all a big if, does keep the Biden team well over 270 electoral votes. But, Garrett, you know this is so well. The Biden team likes to play the long game at a time when we have very short memories, especially voters do. And in, one of the other reasons why North Carolina is so attractive to them is that there are some very clear examples here of recent policy changes that make clear the choice for voters next November, which is, one, the expansion of Medicaid, which just happened last December. That was really what today's event was officially about, the past possibility that this new ex uh, opportunity for 400,000 North Carolinians to get health care who couldn't previously do it would be undone if the Republicans take back power and undo the Affordable Care Act. But then there is the fact that North Carolina is also the only of these eight battleground states that has, since the Dobbs decision, moved further in a restrictive direction when it comes to abortion rights. So those two more recent developments is why I think the Biden team sees this as such a particularly fertile state and why they did the joint show of force, especially with Vice President Harris, who has really led the team here uh, as it relates to reproductive health issues. It's also going to have one of the most interesting governor's races in the country, but that will be a story for another day. Mike Memoli, thank you for your reporting here. Now, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris were not the only campaign ticket on the trail today. Just moments ago, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announced a California attorney and campaign booster Nicole Shanahan as his running mate. Right now, Kennedy's ticket is only on the ballot in Utah, though his campaign claims they have enough signatures, signatures to also get on ballots in New Hampshire and Hawaii. Some states require the full presidential ticket before signatures are even allowed to be gathered, which explains Kennedy's early running mate announcement. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard was at the Kennedy-Shanahan event and joins me now from Oakland. So, Vaughn, let's start with the big question of the day. Who is Nicole Shanahan, and why was she selected as RFK Jr.'s running mate? Let's be clear, uh, Garrett. I did not know who Nicole Shanahan was, and most of the American public at large should not be expected to know who Nicole Shanahan is. That's good. Just for one reference point, on Twitter or X, she had just 1,200 public followers. She had a closed Instagram account, and frankly, talking to folks that were coming in for this VP announcement today, a great many of them told me that they did not know who Nicole Shanahan was, and one person told me assuredly that he, she was definitely not going to be the pick. Well, RFK did in fact make her the pick, and anybody in the United States of America can run for president or vice president, but a big part of that is being able to get enough signatures, Garrett, to qualify for the ballot, and RFK right now is trying to do that in all 50 states. And uh, Nicole Shanahan, she is a philanthropist. She used to be married to a co-founder of Google. Uh, she is a tech lawyer herself, but she does have a big bank account, and she was actually the main funder of that Super Bowl ad for RFK for just last month that folks will recall. And she is, does not have a long-standing relationship with Kennedy on stage. She said she watched an interview about a year ago that he did, and that's when she first got drawn to him. And now, as being a part of this VP ticket, Garrett, she, if she so chooses to, can uh, self-fund effectively their presidential ticket to the extent that she desires. And a big part of that is going to be getting on the ballot in all 50 states, Garrett. Yeah, self-funding always handy. Uh, what did we learn about her from her remarks, Vaughn? How well did she mash, mesh with Kennedy, particularly on some of his more controversial views like those on vaccines? Right. She's 38 years old. She's younger. But by and large, everything she said on the stage was very much reflective 
of Kennedy's public positions here. Uh, like Robert F. Kennedy, she left the Democratic Party within the last year. She is somebody who spoke about being anti-corporate uh, greed, anti-big pharma, uh, somebody who also though, spoke about the importance of clean air and water. But you mentioned vaccines. She suggests that she is vaccine skeptical. And much like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., she is somebody who, around the COVID vaccine, has expressed uh, uh, not only hesitancies, but also reticence. And among the folks that were coming into this event here, you know, there are some who would otherwise say that they would vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, depending on other policy. But by and large, the main issue for the folks here in attendance was around vaccine policy. She herself has a child with autism and she said after uh, her child was born, uh, began investigating what could have caused autism. Of course, uh, scientists have refuted any link between vaccines and autism, yet uh, there is a, a, a wide breadth of the American uh, electorate that uh, is very much keen on further exploring this, and that is the part of the electorate that Kennedy and Shanahan suggest that they want to be on the front lines of advocating for, Garrett. Von Hilliard, fascinating stuff. Thank you for that reporting from the West Coast. And we've got new battleground polling today showing the other two presidential candidates in a pretty tight race for the White House. Today's new polls come from Bloomberg and Morning Consult, and they show former President Trump in the lead in four states, including Georgia and Arizona, those key sunbelt states that President Biden won in 2020. Now, these polls have the race tied in the old blue wall states of Michigan and Pennsylvania, and President Biden up one in Wisconsin. Although we go about the numbers, these are all within the polls' margin of error. Now, the good news for President Biden in these polls is that they appear to show him gaining some ground since February in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and in Michigan. But again, that movement is all inside the margins. So joining me now to talk about it all is Nicholas Wu, congressional reporter for Politico, Megan Hayes, a former special assistant to President Biden, and Hogan Gidley, former national press secretary for the 2020 Donald Trump campaign. So, Nick, I'll start with you. I want to play some of what President Biden has said recently about polls. We'll talk about it on the other side. They report a lot of polls. The last four polls out, we're winning, okay? Yeah. But guess what? None of these polls mean the damn thing this early on. So we just got to keep at it. That is the biggest political cliche on the planet, that the only poll that matters is on Election Day. But does the president have a point here? And I won't penalize you for saying <laughs> we should stop talking about early polls on a show that just started talking about early polls. Well, I think as someone who talks to a lot of congressional Democrats, there's certainly a lot of griping about the polls and, you know, that they are. But at the end of the day, they're still representative of public views at a certain point in time. Now, this could all change between now and Election Day, uh, as we were seeing uh, a few minutes ago with the RFK Jr. bid. Um, that has the possibility to be a spoiler, really, mm -hmm. for either presidential candidate. Um, as we've uh, seen recent reporting that he's flirted with the Libertarian nomination, um, that could draw folks from the right or the left. We don't really know, and you know, there's uh, still lots of different variables between now and Election Day. Hogan, we've seen a lot of President Biden on the campaign trail the last couple of weeks, vanishingly little of Donald Trump except in courtrooms. Is he missing a moment here to kind of keep <clears throat> up on the pace of this campaign? First of all, is, is RFK's pick, you said, 38 years old? That's right. What have I done with my we life? Clearly, I know. <laughs> what are we I doing know. here? This we've is missed ridiculous. Our, we've missed our moment. Uh, look, I, I think a snapshot in time is absolutely correct of what polls are. Mm -hmm. They change and they're going to tighten, obviously, but between now and the time we get to November. But these are all states we're talking about now where Joe Biden and Donald Trump are potentially tied. It's one poll. They oversample Democrats. That's all fine. But the fact that Biden won those states and Donald Trump has a play for those states at this point actually shows a real weakness, I believe, in the Biden campaign and the policies. It goes back to what he has done and put in place for the American people. I argue that those things have really hurt not just our present, but the potential for future gains for this country as well. And you see that in other polls that show the American people don't like where we are on the border, don't like where we are on the economy, don't like where we are with crime, and that Joe Biden is underwater in all of those important issues. And I look for that to be the real issue in this campaign. Yeah, I mean, Megan, to that point, I mean, we've got an election now between two incumbents, basically. There's no, there's nothing theoretical about this. Both of these and have records in the White House. Does that sort of negate a lot of what we traditionally think about campaigning and the value of even some of the basic blocking and tackling, like what, you know, what states you're going to talk about, whatever your plan X is on any given day? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the president and the former president both have a record to run on and things that they've done in the White House and their behavior since the, their time in the White House for president for former President Trump. But as someone who lived through 2020 and 
was a first a day one uh, campaign staffer, you don't live and die by the polls, or we would have been not out of Iowa. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, like, the, as the president said, it's just not something that is going to drive what he's doing. Obviously, they're paying attention to the different issues that are important to folks, and those that, that comes out of the polling, and that actually is important information. But who's winning, and right now, who's ahead? It's all statistically pretty even, so it's not really something to focus on. Well, one thing that's not debatable is this tonal shift from the Biden campaign. I want to uh, read a little bit of this statement that they put out about Donald Trump uh, after his press conference yesterday. Uh, Donald Trump is a weak <laughs> and desperate, both as a man and a candidate for president. Ouch, he can't raise money. He's not interested in campaigning. He said, conclude, America deserves better than a feeble, confused, and tired Donald Trump. If you'd have told me, if you'd taken the Trump out of this and told me this was a Trump campaign statement about Joe Biden, I would have believed it too, right? This is not what we're used to hearing from the Biden campaign. What do you make of that more aggressive posture? Look, I think that the campaign is making a clear choice between the two different folks who are running. And I think that it's, they're hitting the president, president, they're hitting former President Trump in a way that he hits the, mm -hmm. you know, President Biden. It's, it's hot language, obviously. It's not rhetoric that is normal that would come from the president. It's obviously not coming from the president not, right? from his mouth directly. It's coming from the campaign, which is supposed to be the apparatus to make these sort of statements. Um, but it, it's definitely hot. Hogan, <laughs> elevating a debate of this nature with Donald Trump usually ends up with him elevating things on sure. his side here. I mean, is this really the path the Biden campaign wants to go Look, down? The classic counterpuncher is Donald Trump, of course. Uh, but let's be clear. This isn't like Joe Biden is this soft, genteel old man in politics for half of a sure. century. At this point, he literally said Mitt Romney, the milk toast of all people, was going to put black people back in change and reinstitute slavery. So his rhetoric is typically hot. Anyone that talks to the Democrats on Capitol Hill know that while he was a senator, the whole time he's been in office, he's mean, he's tough, and he's going to keep saying these things moving forward. But what's interesting about that statement is it's almost like, no, no, I'm not feeble. You're feeble, mm -hmm. right? No, right. I'm not old. You're old. We all see the pictures. Donald Trump's out there winning golf tournaments. He's playing golf. And Joe Biden's walking around like a Roomba. He doesn't know where he's going half the time. He stumbles through every speech. He stops, doesn't know where he is half the time, loses his train of thought. The American people see that. Again, poll after poll shows it's a real problem for the Democrats, and they know it. That's why they're trying to muddy the water with this type of rhetoric that says, no, no, we're both old. Don't worry about it. We need an ESPN outside the lines investigation <laughs> of Donald Trump winning club championships as his own clubs. But I've, we'll... I've seen him play. He's very good. All right, all right. We'll set that aside. So it turns out there may be another way that get under Donald Trump's skin, whether you mean it or not, and it's to talk to him about whether he's going to spend his money on his campaign like he has said he's going to do. Nick, I asked him this question yesterday. Listen to what he said. Now that the bonds have been reduced, are you going to start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean, frankly. But uh, I might. I might do that. I have the option. I'll be spending money on my campaign. I might spend a lot of money on my campaign. But I should have that option. A crooked judge shouldn't say, we're going to have you post a bond and take all of that money that I could be spending on a campaign or other things if I want to do other things. For a guy with billions of dollars to his name, he has spent zero of them on his campaign since 2016. Should we believe he will now? Oh, I think, uh, I don't know if we can always take uh, the former president at his word, especially on something like that. But look, on paper, yes, he has all of these resources at his disposal, and we know this is going to be a very expensive election. I think the question for him is whether, um, yes, that money will be, he'll, he'll devote that money towards all of his mounting legal bills or towards the campaign. And uh, at least if past the president so far, they're going towards the former. Hogan, we've been doing this for a while. We've already mentioned that we're both overqualified to be RFK's VP. <laughs> Donald Trump now has a stock trading under his initials for the Truth Social uh, brand. It is functionally a meme stock. We'll see how it goes. He could make billions off of it. Sure. What do you make of this new frontier where voters can essentially invest in the candidate himself? And I guess I have to ask you if you own any of it, right, if we're going to talk about this. So what do you make of this? I don't own any of okay. that stock. And also, I have already turned Donald Trump down because he asked me to be the vice president. So breaking news here. I just right, said, no, I'm right, not doing right. that. Look, uh, this is always so interesting to me to watch him market and watch him brand the way he mm -hmm. does because that's what he's so good at. And I think it trades under DJT. That's right. Which is interesting because that's what we call him and that's what we say in texts. Mm -hmm. That's how we refer to him when we're talking inter-staff and inter-campaign, et cetera. And so to watch that across the ticker, you know he loves that. And you know uh, this company obviously is valued worth uh, billions of dollars at this point. 
So we'll wait and see what happens as it relates to the future of the company and also the growth of it. But it is fascinating always to watch and brand. I'm going to let you uh, jump in on this before we go. I mean, are we in a weird new frontier here? I mean, the idea of how much differently campaigns are funded, candidates are invested in. I mean, you want to talk about conflict of interest. A, big, a wealthy investor could go buy a, a million shares in DJT right now. How does that play in a presidential campaign? Do we have I, any idea? I don't think we are in normal territory at all. Um, I think that this is going to be an interesting couple of months coming up. Um, but I would say that in terms of your branding conversation, there's no one more that the president, care, the former president cares about more than himself. So it makes sense that it is DJT. I don't think we're in normal territory <laughs> anymore. will be the new branding <laughs> for this segment. I think we'll just leave it there. All right. Um, Nick, Megan, and Hogan, thank you all for coming in. And we've got more on the breaking news on that Baltimore bridge collapse and the economic impact of the port closure coming up. You're watching Meet the Press now. Nothing normal here. <laughs>Turning back now to that devastating bridge collapse in Baltimore as shipping in the usually busy port remains at a complete standstill. According to the Maryland Port Administration, the Port of Baltimore is the 11th largest port in the U.S. and the 9th largest based on the value of cargo. It's also been the number one port for handling the import and export of cars in this country for 13 straight years. For more on the economic impacts of the bridge collapse, I'm joined now by NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Roman. So, Christine, this is obviously a very busy harbor. Talk yeah. to me about the real economic impact here, both in the short term and the long term, if this takes some time to, to clear that space. Yeah, it's going to take some time to clear that space. And in the very short term, you have incredible disruption here in supply chains. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, the, treasurer, the Secretary of Transportation, said he expects major protracted impact to supply chains here. I mean, even by 7 o'clock this morning, you had major companies already rerouting, um, rerouting their own goods because they knew this was such a big, uh, a big disruption for so many. It's, in particular, I think you're going to be looking at the auto industry uh, very, very closely here. We know that GM, Ford, and Toyota have already started moving their shipments and making changes because their supply chain has been affected here. Uh, these are where cars uh, are imported from here. So you have economists who are saying that there could be some makes and models that it may take a little longer to get them on the uh, on the dealer floor, and it may raise costs a little bit. I mean, the longer, whenever you stretch out a supply chain, it adds to cost. So we'll be very closely watching for that there. But a real disruption for the local community and then broader the sort of the macro picture I think is it's just another snarl uh, of supply chains at a time when prices are many people feel are still too high uh, yeah I, and I'm running out of time so forgive me for asking you an overly sure. complicated question but is, and did anything we all experienced during the pandemic with supply chains uh, getting so bogged down inform how the automakers how other importers and exporters yes. will shift their supply chain can they do it more quickly now than they yes. would have been able to if this happened in 2019 Absolutely. The response today is completely informed by the experience they've already been through. It was almost a dress rehearsal of sorts. Uh, you know, right away, you, they, had, they had the people and the infrastructure in place within many of these companies to quickly switch gears and figure out which ports they need to go to and how to get around any kind of blockage. So, yeah, companies moved very, very quickly on this. And it will add some time, no question, to the delivery of products. Uh, but they have been here before, and they're going to try to minimize that uh, that as much as they can. And I imagine the administration will be watching closely to see what happens on inflation, too, on those products. But yeah. uh, we got to leave it there. Christine Romans, thank you for your expertise <laughs> nice you. on this. And we're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But the news continues right now with Hallie Jackson. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.